Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Please join me in welcoming Father Eric Bergman. You saw perhaps on the 11th of April that uh, the Holy Father made reference to the Armenian Genocide. And he wasn't the first pope to call it that. John, St. John Paul said it. But he spoke uh, extensively about it. And the effect was that the uh, Turkish nation withdrew their ambassador to the Holy See. So we'll see what comes out of that. But it's obviously a wound that hasn't healed yet. It's the 100th anniversary. April 24th is the date that, in our, according to our calendar, it began. Uh, but April 24th for the Armenians is... April 11th. So that's the significance of the Holy Father making those remarks on on April 11th. So really we've, the first, as he called it, the first genocide of the 20th uh, century. So I didn't want to speak today, though that's not the topic of my talk tonight, I didn't want to speak today without remembering them and pointing out uh, that our Holy Father is uh, standing up for the truth. Last time I was with you, now I know that a lot of you weren't there and maybe some of you saw it on, on video uh, on, the, on the website, but I began uh, uh, last time on Palm Sunday with uh, the seven sacraments, and I gave you a summary of how, in fact, I had uh, received all seven. That is unusual in that I'm uh, still here walking around, and I've already received uh, the sacrament of the sick, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that, uh, which is normally for people, the seventh sacrament. I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, how it happened to me before I was ordained. I was, as I reminded you, I was at uh, Yale University in, from 1994 to 1997. I knew there was something wrong with me, and I went to the health clinic, and they misdiagnosed what ultimately was found to be I had a bad uh, gall- gallbladder. So that was in 1995. Well, in January of 2006, uh, things came to a head. So this is 11, 11 years later. And I was so sick, I couldn't stand up in my house. And I, and I said to my wife, I'm dying. And she said, you're not dying. I said, no, I know I am. I know I'm dying. We need to get to the hospital. And uh, I was in such intense pain that I was helped to the car. Uh, they drove me to the hospital, came into the ER, and they, and they were concerned that I was a drug seeker or, or perhaps that I had been beaten up, so they let me sit in the hallway for another hour. And uh, then they uh, finally uh, got me in to a, a, a little room with curtains about it, and I began to vomit. And the doctor said, I think this is just continuation of his irritable bowel syndrome, which is what I didn't have. <laughs> there, I think I'm going to release him. Well, this ch- switch, uh, shift changed. And the, another doctor came in and said, pain is uh, like this is not associated with irritable bowel syndrome. So he said, I'm going to give you heroin. The legal form is dilated. It's the same drug. And so for the first time in my life, I got high. <laughs> but I passed out. And almost immediately, having felt the rush, I, uh, I passed out and uh, stopped vomiting and they were able then to uh, diagnose properly what was really wrong with me, and I had a gangrenous gallbladder. It had been gone untreated for so long that it actually got gangrene, and uh, I had emergency surgery. Uh, They removed it, and in the midst of that, after they gave me uh, heroin, uh, and before the emergency surgery, I was anointed by, at the time, I wasn't ordained yet, uh, who was the man who was our pastor, uh, Monsignor William Falkamp. I recovered. I'm here. Uh, but I, I asked the uh, doctor uh, two weeks later, uh, was I dying? And she said, yes. So really, my, my, my life was spared. But the reason I'm telling you this story is because of St. 
Matthew uh, 15, 19. So if you have uh, Bibles with you, I want to, I'm going to make a bunch of scripture references this night, uh, and, I, and I want you to look at uh, uh, this particular verse, because it ind- indicates something to us about the nature of, uh, of creation. So if we look at, at those verses, we remember uh, Jesus, Jesus saying, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. How we use the things of this world is what makes an action either evil or good. The thing itself is good. It is our hearts that are corrupt. Heroin's a terrible drug in the way that it's affected our nation. But I can tell you it played a part uh, in saving my life. So the created thing is good. The created thing is good. The way we use it can be either good or evil. God is the author of creation. And we see in Genesis, that he pronounces creation good over and over and over again. In fact, at the end, he says, it's very good, right? Creation is good, as we think about the Genesis narrative of creation. Yet the fall happened at the same time through misuse of the created order. In the same way that you gasped, I heard some people gasp when I said the doctor told me he was going to give me heroin, You gasp because of what we associate that with. In the same way, we might think of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as being bad. It wasn't. It was part of the created order which had been pronounced good. But what Adam and Eve did is use it incorrectly. They misused it. Therefore, to communicate Christ's redemptive work in the incarnation, in his becoming man, and his atoning death upon the cross, God has used elements of the created order as tools to bestow graces on the faithful. In the same way that the misuse of the created order brought the fall and sin into the world, so God is going to use elements of the created order to be active means of God's grace. They are tools to communicate God's grace, God's redemption of creation happens through the use of his creation. God's redemption of creation happens through the use of that same creation. So, for example, in baptism, water, a physical thing that all of us need to live, water is used to wash away our spiritual defect. It's a defect that is present and we know is present because of how we just look around and see how the created order is misused. Yet the created thing, water, is used to wash away that spiritual defect that resides in the heart of every person. In confirmation, for example, oil is used to strengthen us and Within the oil that is used uh, in the sacrament of confirmation, you know it's chrism oil, and so what's put inside of it? Uh, Perfume, right? And what does the perfume do? It reminds us of the smell of life. Life smells good. And when we are chrismated, when we are anointed with the chrism, we are reminded, not only are we actually strengthened and made soldiers Uh, for Christ, given a new dispensation of the Holy Spirit, we also smell the beautiful odor of the chrism and know that this is a gift that is given to us, that is, life is being given to us. In marriage, the ministers of the sacrament are the spouses, which points to the reality that in every sacrament, the conduit of God's graces is a human being. So in baptism, it's anybody can baptize, you know that, right? Anybody can baptize, even a person who isn't actually a Christian, if he has the correct intention. 
So in an emergency, uh, anybody can baptize. So the minister of the sacrament of baptism is a person. Uh, the minister of confirmation has to be a priest or a bishop. Uh, but in marriage, in marriage, uh, we know that the ministers of the sacrament are the spouses. And God created and redeemed both of them through, uh, he redeemed them through the blood of the cross. And he sustains them with the Holy Spirit. But he also sustains them by providing them with food, clothing, and shelter. He uses elements of the created order uh, to sustain them physically, but also to sustain them uh, spiritually. And they sustain each other by being ministers of the sacrament, offering themselves to each other. So I'm not going to go through all seven sacraments. But to address what the sacraments actually accomplish in us, I have to first provide some clarity about the work of redemption. What does it mean that we are saved in the blood of the cross? And there's a lot of confusion about that because we live in a country that's ultimately Protestant, uh, founded by Puritans, English Puritans. And uh, therefore, we have, as a people, sort of uh, been fashioned in the image of uh, those original founding fathers who came uh, to Massachusetts in the 1620s. Uh, so there's a lot of confusion about what it means when we say, are you saved? So I want to talk first about justification. So if you have your Bibles, again, look at uh, uh, John chapter 19, uh, verse 34. So we see in, in uh, the Passion narrative uh, from St. John, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth, that you also may believe. The forgiveness of our sins is accomplished in Christ's atoning death. And Christ's atoning death, when we see the water and the blood flowing out of his side, this points to the sacraments themselves. This points to the reality that we are saved through the sacraments. So how do we respond to this question, which is not uncommon for us to encounter on a pretty regular basis by the evangelical Christians. Uh, some people uh, call them fundamentalists, people who hand out uh, tracts, right? And they say, ask you, uh, are you saved? Uh, or maybe some of your evangelical friends have, have asked you this. Uh, what we uh, say is, yes, I was saved in around the year 30 AD when Jesus offered himself upon the altar of the cross at Calvary. By this atoning death, everybody, everybody, salvation is available to everybody. But what Protestants uh, do in asking that is what they really mean is, are you, are you, do you know that you're going to heaven? You're going to be saved, says, well, I know without a doubt uh, I'm going to go to heaven and my salvation is irrevocable. What they do is they collapse justification, sanctification, and glorification into one. And uh, this is not Catholic, of course. It's not even biblical. And so I'm going to demonstrate to you uh, the necessity of separating these three in order for us to understand the necessity of the sacraments. We have to make a clear distinction between justification, sanctification, and glorification in order for us to understand how the sacraments act in our lives and how they are a means to our redemption in the blood of the cross. So the first thing is justification. That happened. Uh, everyone was justified on the day that Christ died, and we are justified uh, in time when we ourselves are baptized. When we, were, when we are baptized in the death of Christ, this is when we ourselves individually are justified. But that does not mean, however, that we are completely pure. Now, of course, we have all of our sins washed away, and so we're holy in that way. And yet we struggle with this thing of concupiscence, this tendency to sin, the, the wound that's left over as a result of original sin. Yes, we have been made holy in the waters of baptism, but yet, yet, 
our sanctification is not entirely complete. And so we have to look at Romans 8, uh, 17. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to that. It is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. All right, so we have been baptized. But after our baptism, there is a period of suffering. And what does this suffering accomplish? Well, we have to look at Hebrews chapter 2. And if we look at Hebrews chapter 2, this uh, uh, beginning at verse 8b, all right, as it is, we do not see, we do not yet see everything in subjection to Jesus. But we see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified have all one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brethren. It is precisely through suffering, to which St. Paul makes reference in chapter 8, of Romans, it is precisely through suffering that we ourselves are sanctified. Jesus is the pioneer, and we, of course, carry our cross and follow him, as he said. You cannot be my disciple unless you take up your cross and follow me. It is precisely through suffering that we are sanctified. So our salvation begins in our justification in the blood of the cross, when we are baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. But it continues then through our sanctification. Recall how I said in the last presentation, if you saw it, and if you didn't, I'll give you a summary, that participation in the sacraments is to enter into the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. It is to enter into his suffering. To receive the sacraments is to enter into his suffering. Remember, St. Paul says we are baptized into his death. When we are baptized, we are baptized into his death. To receive baptism is a willingness, is an admission, a confession that we are willing to be martyrs. We must pour ourselves out as Jesus pours himself out. As Jesus pours himself out to the Father, so we pour ourselves out to Christ himself. We have to pour ourselves out if we hope to enter into life, into the life of the Trinity. We cannot expect to become like God. We can't expect Christian divinization to be ours if we do not do as Jesus Christ does before the Father. Pour himself out completely. We will receive graces from the sacraments insofar as we respond properly. And I talked a lot about that in the last talk, so if you uh, uh, want expansion on that, uh, that that would be uh, the way to go. The graces aren't dependent, of course, upon our belief in them. I'm not saying that at all. But the effect of the graces is magnified if we participate in them properly. In fact... I said last time that if we don't participate in them properly, uh, St. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, with regard to Holy Communion that we can actually eat and drink judgment upon ourselves. Participation in the sacraments in the wrong spirit can actually cause death. Right? So when we enter into them in the right spirit, it magnifies the life that is possible, that is, that is communicated through them. So Scripture then attests to the necessity of our striving if we are to be sanctified. Scripture attests to the necessity of our striving if we are to be sanctified. So look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 tells us uh, really how necessary 
it is for us to strive. So I'm going to begin at chapter 3, verse 12. Now, actually, I'll go back there. I'm going to go back all the way to uh, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own based on law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that if possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That if possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brethren, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature be thus minded, And if anything you are otherwise minded, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. And so, what is St. Paul referring to? What is it that we have not yet attained? What is it that he hasn't yet made his own? Well, that's his glorification. The third step. Justification in our baptism. Sanctification through the Holy Spirit the gifts we receive in the sacraments, in entering into them properly. And then finally, at the end of time, our glorification. So look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 21. I'm going to read two passages from chapter 15. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. And then moving down, after that discussion of the resurrection, he describes it in greater detail. Lo, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable nature must put on the imperishable, and this mortal nature must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? We receive a vision of this glorification then in Revelation. So go to the last book of the Bible, almost the last page, Revelation chapter 21, beginning at at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. It should be obvious to us that this vision that St. John received on Patmos has not yet come to its fulfillment. I began tonight by making reference to the Armenian Genocide, which the Turkish government to this day denies even happened. So there's still many tears. The tears have not been wiped away. We are still in mourning. And of course, our brothers and sisters are still dying. We lost a Melkite priest in Scranton just uh, last Friday, Friday of Easter week, uh, uh, Father Michael Jolly died uh, unexpectedly. And now uh, we have a parish in the city uh, that has no pastor. So 
all we have to do is look around us to see that the glorification about which uh, St. John speaks, about which St. Paul speaks in his epistles, hasn't yet happened. So the message is that because we have been saved in the blood of the cross, and yet we haven't yet been saved, we're in the already and the not yet, we're between. The message is that we must do something in order to participate in our redemption. We cannot simply sit back and say, I believe, therefore I'm saved. And everything's done. I just wait for Jesus to come take me. That's a lie. In order to be united to God, in order to unite our wills with His, in order that our wills be united with His, we must strain. And the sacraments facilitate this effort that we expend. So, yes, we are uniting our wills. Even if we do something good, we attribute it all to God. When we do that which is good, and our straining uh, does advance God's purpose, we do not take credit for it. We attribute it to God. This is not works righteousness. This is cooperation with God's grace. Entering into the redemption, the redemptive work of Christ. This is becoming other Christs. The sacraments all involve the use of created things to communicate the divine. This is best articulated in Holy Communion, which is union with God, but is also union with our fellow believers uh, who have come to the cross in every age. So if we think about Holy Communion, uh, we are one in that sacrament with the church militant. The church militant is the church that's on earth, right? We are one with the church suffering. That's the church that is in purgatory. We are one with the church triumphant, that is the church in heaven. So when we think about communion, we can think about our union with Christ, which is true. We can think about our union with our fellow believers who approach the altar together with us. But there is also the reality of uh, the people who are outside of time in the church suffering uh, sorry in the church triumphant and all those those who are still in time still uniting their wills to Christ still being purgated still being purged of their uh, will still making reparation for the sins they committed on earth we have union with people from every age in the mass The church militant prays with the church triumphant for the church suffering. And we do this in Canon 1. If you read Canon 1, all those saints' names that we pray, right? In the Roman uh, Roman canon, of course. uh, uh, Unfortunately, too many priests hardly ever say it. uh, But but, uh, that canon should be prayed really every Sunday to remind us of the reality, of the reality that the church militant prays with the church triumphant for the church suffering. Because most of our mass intentions, and when we have them, are for people who are dead. It's true that we occasionally, uh, uh, the church militant prays with the church triumphant for the church militant. Sometimes the intention of the mass is for a living person. And indeed, your, your intentions may be, your private intentions may be for living people. They may even be for yourselves. But most often, The Mass intention is for the deceased. So it is a union in every time the Mass is celebrated of the Church militant, the Church suffering, and the Church triumphant. The sacraments therefore prefigure the communion that we will only enter into fully when we ourselves have actually been glorified. In uh, the truest sense of the word. For for now, they are aiding in our sanctification, having united 
their sacrifices to Christ's own. Right now, right now, the church triumphant is aiding through their prayers in our sanctification since they, unlike us who are still suffering from concupiscence, they have completely united their sacrifices to Christ's own with no blot, no blemish. Their sacrifices are completely united with Christ's own. The communion that we seek then is more than the eye can see. It is supernatural. We can't see it, but it is more real. It is more substantial than the communion that we can see. We are more closely united in receiving Holy Communion. When you receive the host placed upon your tongue or the precious blood, or perhaps if you're an Eastern Catholic, when you receive uh, both together, you are more closely united to your brothers in heaven, more closely united to them who are completely united to Christ than you are even with the people right next to you. It's, it's a more substantial union, a more substantial union than the union that we can see. Because those who have gone before us are fully united to God. We are united to the names of all those saints who are said every time we pray Eucharistic Prayer 1. And, of course, in Eucharistic Prayer 3, you can add the names of your patron and so forth. Uh, But we always mention the Blessed Mother, and since uh, Pope Francis included it, we also say St. Joseph in every Eucharistic prayer. We are united to them. They are fully united to Christ. Now note that the passages that we looked at in the discussion of the necessity of our continued sanctification, all of them, if you look at Philippians chapter 3, if you looked at Romans chapter 8, they flow into immediately a discussion about reconciliation within community. The necessity of sanctification flows directly into discussion about the necessity of reconciliation with the community. So if you go back to Philippians chapter 4, this is right after the passage that we just read. Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Sictiki to agree in the Lord. And I ask you also to yoke fellow, help these women. For they have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So, here's some women that are fighting in the community. And the uh, Apostle Paul says, help them get along. All right? Sanctification issues in community. If we strive, as St. Paul describes, we will foster community. And I want your striving to foster community between these two women who aren't able to get along with one another. And sanctification, he makes clear, takes place within the context of Christian community. And so, without even turning your page, you can look at at, uh, 317, which is just before the verses I read. Brethren, join in imitating me and mark those who so live as you have an example in us. And then go across the page and look at verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace will be with you. Sanctification takes place within the context of community. Romans 8 Tells us, shows us the same thing. So let's look at Romans 8, verses 1, 31 to 39. What shall we then say to this? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him, up, gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Is it Christ Jesus, who died, yes, who was raised from the dead? who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are being killed all the day long. 
we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a reiteration of the promise in Matthew with which I began last time on Palm Sunday. Lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Our communion, which is in community, our communion is based in and with Jesus Christ. So whatever communion we enjoy, whatever sanctification is able to be fostered and accomplished within the context of community, is through Christ. It is in and with Jesus Christ. He is with us to the close of the age. And we are called to draw more people into it. Roman 9, Romans 9 is about Paul's, St. Paul's heartache over the reality that so many of his Jewish brethren have not come into the church, have not received his preaching in the way that the Gentiles did. Our communion is not one that exists for itself, but is for those who are not yet part of it. Our communion that we enjoy, this community by which we are sanctified, in which we are sanctified, it is not something that exists for itself. It is for those who are not yet part of it. 1 Corinthians, the passage I read from chapter 15 there, this is the end of the book, the end of that book of the Bible. And he ends his uh, letter to the Corinthians which was in many ways a rebel church, he ends his letter with words about our glorification because the entire epistle is an appeal for communion. The entire epistle, he begins with get along, in the middle is get along, and in the end is this is what's going to happen if you get along. Our communion with each other should be a reflection of the union between Christ and the church. Now he makes that more, even more explicit in Ephesians 5, and we'll get to that in a sec. Entering into the sacraments, then, is an act of love. Because the sacraments tend toward communion, because the sacraments involve self-emptying, because the sacraments issue in sanctification, through the sacraments we become more like God, who is love. When we enter into the sacraments, and they are an act of love, this is what Christian divinization is. We become more like God, who is love. St. Paul, as I said, teaches us in Ephesians 5, that the sacrament of holy matrimony is an image of the love between Christ and his church. And so, indeed, we should read that as well. And it's at the very end of uh, the chapter. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is a profound one, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. The sacrament of holy matrimony is an image of the love between Christ and his church. Marriage is a means to sanctification because of the holistic self-oblation that is necessary if we are to receive this sacrament with the proper disposition. Marriage is the means to sanctification because of the holistic self-oblation that is necessary if we are to receive this sacrament with the proper disposition. The family is the domestic church. And if this communion breaks down, then naturally we will see a breakdown in how we love those who are outside the home. If the communion in the home, the domestic church, breaks down, well then we're going to have a breakdown in our communion with others, with those who are outside the home. Book 19 uh, of the City of God is a... uh, 
the city of God, if there's one book that I would tell anybody in the Western civilization, anybody in the West, actually anybody at all, but if you want to understand Western civilization, you have to read book 19 of the city of God. And so I, I throw that out to you as a recommendation. You should have a copy on your bookshelf of the city of God. You have to read the right books. Everybody should have that book in his library. If you have two books in your library, the Bible and the city of God. All right. Book 9 of the City of God talks about how if we have comity in the home, then we will have it in our communal life. And he talks about the patrifamilias. That's something I'm going to talk about in my next talk here with the Institute uh, in, in June. So how the patrifamilias, the head of the household, how he treats his spouse will indicate whether he is a servant or a master, whether he expects order or he countenances chaos. How he treats his spouse will indicate whether he gives or whether he uses. How he treats his spouse will indicate whether he donates himself or whether he objectifies his beloved. If we desire the restoration of our community's moral life. If we desire the restoration of our nation's moral life, if we desire the restoration of the West's moral life, then we must begin in the home. We must begin with Christians who are in sacramental marriages. We must begin among Christians who are wedded in the sacrament of holy matrimony. For one cannot sanctify his spouse if his relationship is inherently sinful. How can we sanctify as ministers of the sacrament in holy matrimony? We cannot sanctify our spouse if the relationship that we are engaged in, the relationship we've entered into, is inherently sinful. In fact, we should read precisely the purpose of marriage, and St. Paul makes it very clear. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Only if we love properly, if we love properly, if we enter into the sacrament of holy matrimony with the correct disposition, can we sanctify our spouse and our spouse sanctify us. So the restoration of communal life our community's moral life, our nation's moral life, will come when there is a restoration in the home of the moral life. When our marriages are lived sacramentally through the observance of St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body, which you may or may not know is an expansive articulation of Blessed Paul VI, Humana Vitae. There was a question and answer session last time, and uh, one of the ladies raised her hand, and I was talking about how do we uh, do what you're explaining? And I gave a preview by simply saying uh, what I'm saying today. I said, live humana vitae. How are you going to be missionaries in the world? How are we going to transform creation? That was the name of the talk last time. How are we going to transform creation? We're going to begin with those in the church who are sacramentally married living out holy matrimony. What I'm talking about is contraception and the neutralizing effect that it has on the sacramental life. Contraception neutralizes the sacramental life. It inoculates us from the sacraments. If we contracept, then we cannot receive the graces that the Lord desires to give us in the sacraments. Contraception teaches those who use it to conceive of others as threat. And this is where we get the language of protection. Did you use protection? We need to protect ourselves from people who do things like the Armenian Genocide. 
That's who we protect ourselves from. We need to protect ourselves from the people who are running wild right now in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Syria, in Iraq. Yes, we need protection from them. They are a threat to our existence. They are a threat not only to the order of our community, but a threat to our very lives. We need to protect ourselves from them. This is where we use the language of protection. We do not use the language of protection in the bedroom. We do not use the language of protection in relation to our spouse, in relation to our beloved. I do not protect myself from my wife. Nor should you protect yourself from your husband. Whereas sacraments are received seeking the good of the other, we enter them, enter into them for the good of our neighbors. As I said, the church doesn't exist as a club of saints. It exists for the benefit of those who are outside of it. So whereas the sacraments are received seeking the good of the other, contraception does precisely the opposite. It sets oneself against community in the language of protection and seeing the other as threat, as the other as rival, as the other who's going to take something from me or perhaps even destroy me. Contraception trains us trains us to set ourselves against this very idea of community. The idea of community becomes impossible. I talked last time about sending missionaries into American communities, people who are willing to pour themselves out for the good of those around them, having a sanctifying presence in the midst of those who need the presence of Jesus Christ. Such missionaries must be living the gospel of life. If they do not have this down, they're useless, and I don't want them. I want people to move to Scranton. I want them to move into the poor neighborhood in which I reside. I've invited people to do that, to be an example to people so that they can see another way, but also to be a sanctifying presence among those who are living in darkness. But if you are contracepting, please don't move to my neighborhood. If they don't have this down, if they don't understand how contraception destroys community, how it is impossible to foster community and have contraception at the same time, then they will fail as missionaries. Why was the American church, I ask this question, why was the American church so open to the use of contraception? I talked about that in a presentation I made here at Lambeth, about Lambeth 1930, a few years ago. Why was the American church so open to its use? Why did it happen so quickly that we went from a faithful church to a church that was unfaithful with her this, in, in this regard? It was because they had been prepared by years of a preservationist and assimilationist mentality. That is, uh, preserve what they had or assimilate with everyone else. In either direction, in either case, the objective was not to suffer. Whether we were preserving what we had or... Uh, assimilating to go along to get along the objective was no suffering so if contraception is a rejection of a missionary spirit the inhibitor to community and the destroyer of our nation's moral fabric chastity on the other hand is the very means or rather a means to sanctification and I'm going to tread lightly here But I want you to understand that the marital embrace itself is so pure, it is so holy, that when it is entered into sacramentally, it is a prefiguration of heaven. It is a gift, a precious gift that is a prefiguration of heaven and is an illustration of the union between Christ and his church. It is a prefiguration of heaven as well as an aid to get there. It is a way to become like God. This is what all the people who are sex crazed are missing. They're missing by profaning this beautiful sacrament, by profaning this beautiful gift. They can't see that chastity is a means to become like God. It is a means to Christian divinization. 
the very fruit of the marital embrace points to life. You know that uh, two virgins who marry each other and remain faithful for life cannot get venereal disease. It's impossible. The natural law in this regard then points to the moral law and points to the truth of Paul's revelation about marriage. The marital embrace not only can't kill you (laughs) if you marry as a virgin or remain faithful, it can't. You will never die from that. That's one thing you can't die from. As corrupt as our creation has become, you can't die from that. It also issues in life. To receive the gift is to receive the life that God wants to give us. To receive the gift of children, the one flesh about which St. Paul talks in Ephesians, to receive this gift is to receive the life that God wants to give us and points to the life to come. So marriage, the marital embrace, points to the life to come because it issues in life. All life. It's all life. It's all about life. The alternative is also true. Pope Francis said that a nation without children is a nation without hope. Well, guess what? We're a nation without children. I see you, though. But we only have, our birth rate is less than two. Native-born American women have only 1.88 children in their lifetimes. In places in Europe, it's even lower. 1.1, Spain. Ah! Italy's population is going to drop by 17 million in the next 50 years because the birth rate's below two. Japan, that's not in the West, uh, but their, their birth rate's 1.1 also. A nation without children is a nation without hope. We're living in the midst of all kinds of nations without hope. I became a Catholic uh, only two months. It was October 31st. I received the grace of confirmation and First Holy Communion, having gone to confession about a week before. And uh, so I received sacraments in pretty close succession because I came close to death in January. So it was two and a half months from the time that I was confirmed to the time that I almost died. So I became a Catholic just in time to receive the grace of the sacraments. And what I can tell you is that the Lord uh, gave me a second chance. He spared my life that day so that I could give life. At the time, uh, my wife and I had three children. Uh, we had have, we've had five children since then. Uh, we've had five children since uh, the... Uh, and as uh, you were told before I, my talk began, uh, we have another one on the way. So soon it'll be six that we've had since my uh, near-death experience. If we enter into the sacraments sacrificially, they will issue in life. I have no difficulty at all saying with you, or rather saying with St. Paul, imitate me. Thank you. Very, very slightly. I got in a disagreement over the weekend with someone who claimed very, very definitively that Catholics cannot say that they have been saved or are saved. And I just, maybe you could help me figure out a better way to have responded to him than the way I did. Or maybe he's right, but I disagreed with him. Well, we, we don't say, I, uh, we, I am saved. We, we speak in the same language as St. Paul and say that I, I uh, was saved, and not that I have made it my own, but I am continuing to strive. And so, we were saved. Like, we, were saved. We, uh, we were saved. We don't say, I am saved. We say, I was saved. That is to say, Christ died on the cross to save everybody. And that's the reality. So that, uh, the salvation has been secured. We have to respond appropriately and make sure we don't die 
in a state of mortal sin, right? So that uh, we haven't killed the life of grace that lives within us as a result of our baptism, as a result of consuming our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity. So, so uh, we have to respond appropriately. We have to enter the sacraments the correct way in order to make sure that we are, in fact, at the end of time saved. But we say, I was saved, I hope to be saved. We're getting a question online. Um, it says, what do the saints and the Father say about divinization? Well, the, obviously, nothing. I never claim anything for myself. I'm simply communicating to you what has already been said. The Eastern Fathers, actually, talked a lot more about Christian divinization than have the, the Western Fathers. And what I say... To, to the person who asked that question is essentially what I articulated today, that Christian divinization is to become like God. And indeed, this will be fully accomplished in, in uh, the last day. Now, one of the things we ought to, we ought to keep in mind is understand when I, when I talk to you about the last day uh, when Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead, that the saints are outside of time. Those who are in heaven, who are before the throne of grace, are outside of time. Now, they can see us inside of time, but they are not bound by the same constraints that we are. Our bodies haven't been transformed, and though the dead have not yet been raised imperishable, as St. Paul said, they at the same time, we have to say, have been glorified. They are glorified, and they have been completely united to Christ. Uh, their wills are completely united to God. They've gone, gone through their purgation. They've made their reparation, and they are one with God. You may have alluded to this, but it's a question I asked, I have wondered about, and so I want to make sure. Are those in purgatory still somehow in time because it's a temporary state? It's a temporary. It is a temporary thing. And, and in fact, uh, the, 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 the best, the best uh, answer to that question came from our late, our Blessed Mother, at uh, Fatima, where the girls and the boy, they, they, they had a couple of people in the town in Fatima who had died recently when she appeared to them. Uh, and so they asked about one of their friends who was about the same age and, uh, and asked about her and said, oh, Mary said, well, she's, in my bo- she's with me in my bosom. And the second one, they, it was an older girl, and uh, they asked about her and she said, she's in, she will be in purgatory until the end of time. So, yes, it is a, uh, it is, uh, a suffering. Uh, we, we shouldn't... Uh, St. John Vianney compared uh, purgatory to uh, the... Pur- he said, the only difference between the fires of hell and the fires of purgatory is that the fire, in the fires of purgatory there's hope. <laughs> so, now, I, that's not church doctrine. That's simply what St. John Vianney said, but I think he was trying to communicate, trying to impress upon us that purgatory involves real suffering. We don't call the church suffering for nothing. We really have to let go of uh, our wills. And for some, that takes longer than it does for others. So the time in purgatory isn't the same for everyone. The church used to communicate this in uh, the granting of indulgences, where they'd have things that would say like 30 days, 100 days, uh, and, and, and so you would apply this and now, obviously, we didn't know it was exactly uh, days. It was simply the church's way of saying, this is a more powerful indulgence than the other one. Uh, and so the whole days thing has been removed since the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. But nevertheless, uh, there is an understanding that uh, reparation has to be made, and it is temporal, because it's temporary, and uh, it involves suffering. Do you have to be perfect to get to heaven, like have a all the patients in the world. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And, and, and what, I, what that means then is really what we're talking about tonight, Christian divinization. You must be like God. And for many of us, and St. Therese of Lisieux said, don't think that you can't go straight from earth to heaven. She said, it's possible. You can do that. Don't think that Everyone has to pass through purgatory. Uh, there are some people who have their purgatory on earth. Uh, but what has to happen is that our 
wills are so united with Christ uh, that we are truly one with him. But also, what we can't forget is the reality that there is a difference between being forgiven and the sin itself being wiped away and the reparation that we must make for the sins we committed. So if we think about the example that I use with my children uh, in First Holy Communion class and Confirmation class is imagine that you're driving down the road and you have a priest in the car, Father Bergman's in the car with you. You're driving down the road and you hit a bicyclist because you're playing with the radio. You get out of the car and you say, I'm so sorry, you're on your knees. And you say, Father, I, I was careless and I need to make my confession. And I say, okay, and I hear your confession and I bless you. Grant, give you uh, penance and uh, absolution. And you drive away. Well, no, of course not. You bind up the bicyclist's wounds. You put him in the car. You take him to the hospital and you say to the doctors, I'll pay the bills. It's my fault. Right? There's a difference between the sin that you committed and the effects, the consequences of that sin. And both have to be addressed. One is addressed in the blood of the cross. The other is addressed in your willingness to cooperate with grace and repair, bind up the wound that you caused. And when we have united our wills and we've bound up all the wounds that we've caused, heaven. Thank you very much, Father Bergman. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.